Bulawayo's water supply. My embryo matured its limbs in liquid, and after birth I stayed the same, subaqueous, in oceanic settings beyond my comprehension, with sea a symbol of my baby ignorance. And even as a plump and wordless toddler, the deep pile on my parents' patterned carpet appeared as tall as seaweed lightly swaying, while strong and distant currents circled elsewhere. Like minnows in a rock pool, blind to large dimensions, I thought my pond was universal, and seals and squid and more the ocean's surface were phantom beasts I'd not encountered. And so as well my cot in Bulawayo, in which I spent long days of dreaming, and round whose bars all action focused, was clearly stationed at the planet's centre. In time, my head approached the air of reason, and soon my skull top formed a lonely island, and then perception and comparison descended past my hair and eyelids, and I could see my hometown's ratings, a shock which grew each hour of daylight, a minor town, five thousand miles and more from sources of its law and culture. The colours, which till then had dazed me with brightness of a new-found Eden, and the rocks and bricks which had so far rebuffed me with strength as if each one were Samson, were greatly weakened now that I detected that I was stranded in a far-flung boondocks, as much a jolt as when a Polish savant confirmed the sun controls our orbits. So Bulawayo fell from global apex to a petty place no one had heard of. Its streets and shops and fifties drive-in were now diminished and so provincial. The door to paradise had closed behind me, my boyhood spiritless and wilting, as wider survey sucked the moisture from the riches of its previous stature. I'll not address the racial policy and other sins of being a colony, since I'm concerned with how an infant perceives and tests its home surroundings. For me, it meant a loss of beauty, as golden fish flap tails in puddles, and Bulawayo turned desert ruin when the water stopped and the air crept in.